in five, four, three, two, and one. And welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. Welcome everyone to this episode of the Real Leaders Podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Edwards. Joining us today is Megan Kaiser, the COO of Perry Agricultural Laboratories. Megan, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me on. Absolutely. Well, Megan, first and foremost, you're a farmer, correct? That's correct. My husband and I uh, farm soybeans and corn in northern Missouri with our two young children. Mac is six and Nora is nine months. Amazing. Incredible. Well, what got you into farming in the first place? Well, marriage first. <laughs> um, no, I, it's a bit of a story, I guess. But um, I, uh, my family started Perry Agricultural Laboratory in 1982. And I grew up on everybody else's farm, I guess you could say. Um, by the time I was nine, my dad, um, you know, we got like this little rickety go-kart and he put one of the very first GPSs on the top and he said, here, you can go run this around the fields. And so, um, you know, we, we grew up talking to farmers and trying to help them with their, their nutrients um, uh, analysis coming here at the lab and then helping them put decide what to put on. And I, I grew up watching my parents make a difference for farmers. And so I majored in agriculture. Um, I actually worked in ag policy in Washington, D.C. for a couple of years. And then I met my husband, uh, who was a Missouri farmer. And um, we uh, I moved back to Missouri and we got married and the rest is history. It's incredible how far we've come since probably when you started farming. Oh, my enlighten our audience and tell them kind of what you learn along this journey well i think um the interesting thing is there's no average like a day in the life you know um we're very seasonal focused that this is what we do during planting this is what we do during the growing season this is what we do during harvest and then once harvest is over we're planning for the next planting cycle mm. and um the thing that has changed the most just in you know the short amount of time since we've been farming which is uh 2012 for my husband and i together and um i think the thing that has struck me the most is how much more often we are looking at our tablets or our phones where we can monitor our irrigators our grain bins um, i can pull up while i'm standing in the field pulling a tissue sample from one of the crops i can i can look and see exactly what my soil test read i can see the health of the crop um, that i'm looking at and do a lot of ground truthing and i'm only able to do that because i have this technology literally in my palm uh, that I can overlay data and make better data-driven decisions. That's fascinating. So <laughs> you, an app, many apps, multiple apps can just measure and mm -hmm. kind of indicate to you just like, I don't know what, how your farm is, is being managed and being worked. Yeah. So um, everything we, we start with basically the data that comes out of the tractors or, um, and then we can put data back into the tractors. So just like uh, any, any other high tech machine, we have, um, you know, screens that are showing us how many seeds we're planting in the ground. We can vary that based on past production on our soil, um, our, our, um, our texture and holding capacity abilities in the soil. Um, then we, we can monitor at the end of the season, as we're driving through with our combines, we can calculate and see exactly, you know, within 50 square feet, exactly what the yield is. Mm -hmm. And we can then take all those layers of data and say, well, I did this management practice in this portion and I got this yield and did that work? Did it make a difference? I mean, why would I put, do any kind of um, application that wouldn't, improve my yield or improve the the sustainability of my crop or the health of my crop. And so by having the technology where we can overlay all those layers of data, um, it, it's made us more efficient and it's made us more um, economically sustainable. Obviously you want this to increase your, your yields, your bottom line. What does it take? Is it just like one thing that could just go completely wrong that could disrupt a cycle? Um, and what yeah, is, it's like, called weather. <laughs> exactly. Like, how important is um, you know your soil health, and mm -hmm. you know the the contributing factors that could entirely disrupt a, a cycle. Yes, 
Um, rain or a lack of rain can be the major disruptor every year. I mean, the first thing that you will hear in every farmer's conversation is, well, did you get much rain lately? Or have you had too much rain? Mm -hmm. One of the ways that we can buffer ourselves on that is by improving our soil health. And so what I mean by that is I can look at the calcium and the magnesium on my soil test, and I can see that calcium kind of, um, kind of pulls things apart and magnesium kind of brings things together. And when I have that imbalance, I create pore space is what we call it. And that is my air holding capacity, my water holding capacity, and also kind of the house where the microbes live. Mm -hmm. And when I have that pore space, if I get a heavy rainfall event, my soil can hold it. It can, it can suck it in and hold it. And then when we don't get rain for a little while and my crop needs more water, it can take it from those pores and turn it back into air holding capacity. Mm -hmm. um, and so having that fluctuation is incredibly important to not only, um, you know, just growing a crop, but the, it's kind of the immune system of the crop too. being able to better, better withstand short periods of, extra water in short periods of, of not enough. I heard that in like a gram of soil, there's like four to 50,000 different species of like microorganisms, mm -hmm. microorganisms in it. What's it's in your incredible. soil? <laughs> it's an incredible amount. And the, the, um, you know, there's all sorts of research going on to find out, you know, what are the right microbes and what do they do? Here's what I know is the most important part for me is that I have to have that pore space so the microbes have a place to live. And when they're there, they can take that crop residue on the top and they munch it down and they turn it into organic matter or humus, which even more improves my, um, my soil health. It's my ability to hold on to nitrogen and sulfur, which aren't, aren't, um, they're, they're negatively charged. And so they're not able to be held in, in the soil like calcium and magnesium. I know I'm getting really in the weeds here, but this is why it's so important. This is a real science that farmers know and that we have to manage and monitor. So we wanna stimulate those microbes to have a, a healthy place to live so that they can turn over my last year, what's left of my last year's corn crop after harvest, break it down, turn it into um, humus, and that in turn provides a place where I can store nitrogen and sulfur for my next crop. Mm, okay, so can we break this down just a little bit <laughs> like in layman's terms? Like when you, so are you talking about like when you till the soil, when you take your crops and everything kind of falls down and regenerates and that holds and kind of sequesters everything in there? And like not, not even right. about the tillage. So when I take my combine across the field and it takes in the stalk goes in, and it chews it up and basically I get the grain. And then we have a chopper on the back where it breaks everything up um, so that um, then we have a little bit of ground protection. Um, a couple of things happen then. The more that we can break that up, we add surface area for the microbes to kind of munch on that, that crop residue and break that down and turn it into humus. Okay, okay, yeah. Now, how important are these microorganisms to our basic survival. Like I, I've heard soil is such an incredible nutrient for uh, obviously everything that goes on in our ecosystems and is we're like, we're entirely dependent on soil, water, air and, and healthy, you know, ecosystems. So like what specifically is, I guess, is a microorganisms role in soil health? Well, I think, um, the number one thing is the nutrient turnover, the, the turning the, the crop residue into humus and, and that then makes your, your soil healthier, have better water holding, nutrient holding capacity. Um, I think it's important that we also think about the soil is a lot like the human body. And when we talk about like gut health, that's the microbes in the soil. We know okay. that it, it really right. does a lot of, of the work. Um, those microbes are required to kind of turn our elemental um, nutrients into a form that the plants can take up. Um, and it, it, they really, um, when the microbes have a, a nice place to live, they help expand that and continue that, that improvement of the soil structure, uh, because of the work. So, you, you know, often we can see earthworms and I think anyone who has gardened would know that if you dig in and you see a bunch of earthworms, you've got a pretty good thing going. Uh, because they ha they have the ability to kind of move around. That's a pretty macro 
um, organism in the soil. <laughs> That's a big thing compared to what we're talking about. Um, but even then those microbes, after they eat and they, they, they eventually die and even their bodies are then turned into the nutrient turnover um, that is available then for plants to take up. So they're, they're just kind of like the mover and the shaker in the soil world of, of making that, that whole circle um, turn. The, the circle of life, if you will. The circle of life, exactly. And so I guess what's in the in previous years, like what have been the challenges with restoring this circle of life? Like what practices, I guess, could you like let our audience know that really have been contributing to like the degradation of soil? Awareness. I think the first thing mm -hmm. is awareness. You know, um, it's fitting that my dad says this since he started a laboratory, but he has always said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. Hmm. And that is where technology and especially precision agriculture has really improved the way that we can picture it. We can see these things happening. Um, if you're looking at an 80 acre field and you're just looking at your average yield and your average input, you can't you can't manage that on on such a micro level. But if I break up that field and we're managing every two and a half acres or we're using our yield data and creating management zones and we know that this portion of the field acts in a similar way and, and reacts to management in a silver, similar way, um, then we know how we can micromanage our farm better. And so technology has really helped us to be able to kind of know in general, you know, how something might be to really saying, you know, this sand, this soil is very sandy. It's right next to a not so sandy. And then beyond that is like a clay. And all of the, the ability to hold on to nutrients, to have um, the, the home for the microbes, to build a good structure is all really dependent on those factors. And so you can't manage a sandy soil the same that you would a really high clay soil. And being able to measure that on a on a very small level, we call it precision agriculture, and that's a great name for it because we are more precise and we're able to really um, really manage things in a more precise, repeatable way. And you're in Missouri, as we call it, right? <laughs> yeah. and so obviously there is a ton of farming in, in the heartland of the United States. Um, I've heard that the soil health is not as good as it was prior to industrial agriculture. Do you agree or is there a misconception of uh, the soil health from industrial monocultural and you know, agricultural farms? Well, I'll tell you this. Um, we farm here in Missouri, but our laboratory, um, we, we do soil testing in 75 countries in all 50 states. And those samples come right here into Missouri and we, and we take a look at them. And what I will say is that um, it, it doesn't, um, it, it doesn't do us justice to say, you know, oh, we, we were all, everybody was bad. Everybody was doing it wrong. I mean, we've had, we work with some farmers, um, or to say that one practice is completely bad. Mm. I think that we work with, um, everybody from non-GM, conventional and organic all over the world. And, You've got people who are really paying attention and really working to make sure that what's in the soil is in the plant, what's in the plant is in the animal or the human, mm -hmm. and that, that that nutrition starts at the soil level. And so if we're looking at the nutrients and managing them very closely, um, I think there's more awareness now, again, because we can repeatedly measure these things and we can we know that if I put this on uh, or if I measure it, I put this on, I take this off and I measure it again. There should be some continuity. We're able to do that because of technology, especially in the lab industry. And I think that that makes us all better because um, you can't set a goal if you don't even know where to begin. And in this case, we can say, all right, we have a desired level we need to get to. We'll build there. Um, we know that there's balances between different nutrients that, that help to drive the Krebs cycle in the plant. Um, we know that the more we do with our soil, the less additives that we have to do later on in our feed for animals. And so it all starts with the soil so we can produce a healthy crop that's either going to go as feed to an animal and then to the human or directly to a human. 
Well, let's talk about that a little bit more. Like, I, I love that concept of precision agriculture and kind of what you're doing to to measure in, inputs and outputs. When we think about business, we think about a single unit of measurement that we can all kind of tacitly or explicitly agree upon, and that's the dollar, right? Mm-hmm. An actual financial outcome that you can use, you know, your lefts and your rights. But when it comes to measuring impact, there's all sorts of things people want to measure. Is there a specific unit? Is it energy? Is it sugar? Is it um, chemical mo- molecules? What specifically are you measuring in your laboratory? In our laboratory, we're measuring the nutrient content. Okay. And so we're measuring um, on the elemental level of how many pounds of calcium, magnesium, potassium, phosphorus, sulfur, um, boron, zinc, copper, manganese, iron. And then we're also measuring the humus content um, of the organic matter. And so is there one element that really matters? No, there is, it, it, it is, you have all these essential elements that are incredibly important to crop health and um, there's not just one thing you can do. And that's maybe why it's so complicated sometimes is that we ha- we can't just say, oh, I, I'm just going to look at my phosphorus or I'm just going to look at my potassium. If I don't have enough micronutrients to drive the Krebs cycle, then that's my limiting factor. And so, um, you know, in agriculture, though, well, we're talking a lot about it all starting in the soil. Yeah, the dollar at the end of the day is going to be um, a pretty important um, aspect to what drives the uh, financial sustainability of my farm. I think, though, that um, what is unique about agriculture is that we think in generations. Mm-hmm. And I didn't realize that until somebody pointed it out to me and that we're a little bit different that way. Um, you know, we're the fifth generation um, on Kaiser Family Farms, and we're raising the sixth generation. And um, when I'm doing something, you know, my son often will come into our office and say, look, mommy, I pulled a soil sample. You know, he's six years old, and he knows that that's such an important part of what we do on the farm is that we're measuring it as we go. And um, I think that that is measuring and improving um, is a very big aspect to agriculture because we think about every day, will this be here for the sixth generation or the seventh generation? And we know if we completely just deplete the soil, one, it won't perform for us, but two, it certainly will not perform for the next generation. It is interesting to think about, right? Like how rapidly and fast environments and land can change to not produce like crops or life anymore. Like arid deserts used to have bodies of water, right? Flowing through them. And now like the Sahara Desert, there's nothing there. There's barely anything there. And so with this long-term approach, like do you have advice or perspective on how we need to refocus our current state of agricultural production? That's a deep question because, you know, every every farm is different. And I think um, we're all learning from each other. And I think that that's really important that we are learning from, you know, in, in California, there's a rich history of agriculture and a very diverse group of agriculturalists in, in that state. And then I look at what can I learn from California and imply here on on my ground in Missouri that maybe would have been more foreign in decades past where we're like, well, you don't know what it's like here. And I think that opening up perspectives and being open to, um, you know, niche markets that right now I grow soybeans and corn and I sell them as a commodity. Um, But if somebody says, hey, we really like the quality of the soybeans on your farm because I have a specific, um, you know, herd of of, um, head of pigs, you know, that they um, really need that amino acid that you have a lot of in your soybeans, then why don't we make a deal and direct market to that group? I think that kind of work is more... um, likely in the future because we're able to say, look, I can test all these things. I can show you um, all of the benefits of buying my soybeans that um, I did because of the work I did on my farm and my soil. And now my sustainability story is going to be transferred on 
to um, the, my first purchaser who will then get to pass that on to their next person, et cetera. And I think that we're already seeing that in some ways that U.S. soy is so sustainable um, that compared to other parts of the world that uh, we, we have, you know, other countries and other businesses outside, especially that request, you know, I want your certification of your U.S. soy. Um, I want to put that on my product because it shows that I care that we have minimal land use changes happening in the United States, that we're, con we're continually working on minimizing land erosion. We're trying to keep our soil in the, in the same spot, that we are aware of our footprint on the earth and that we're, we're trying to make sure that we um, leave less of a footprint first. And, and second, that we're, we're actually helping to offset other sectors of, of the world. Mm. So as the, as the COO, you're in charge of all the operations. Like, What are some examples of how you've learned from other different types of farms? Obviously, you're testing, you're doing all that lab work. But for your own farm yourself, what are some operational changes that you've learned from other different uh, locations? Yeah, I think um, some of the things that I've noticed is that um, people have, we, we talk a lot about tillage, a lot about soil erosion. And when I travel to other parts of the world, um, seeing that, well, actually we, we don't use tillage in our part of the world as much as some other places. And it's crop dependent as well. Um, I think that when I think about my um, neighbors and my you know friends that farm here in the Midwest, we're very mindful of trying to keep our topsoil where it is. Some of it is utilization of cover crops. Some of it is utilization of minimal or no-till. Uh, but a lot of it is making sure our soil is right first and that we've kind of built that, that correct structure to sustain the soil staying put and also sustaining the crop. Mm. Uh, I have a friend who has like, his grandpa has this farmer's almanac. It's this old <laughs> farmer's almanac and it had like all these different like phases of the moon or sun and like all these different things that could impact your weather. Like how many different outside variables uh, for people listening to this can really impact the outcomes of your yields? You mentioned erosion, you mentioned uh, maybe development. What are some things that we can do as a society to ensure um, that the soil remains healthy? Well, the, that's kind of a, a mixed egg. When I first where I was going with your question, I was thinking about all of the different things that impact the amount and quality of my crop. Mm -hmm. um, weather is probably the number one thing. And obviously weather impacts your soil too. If it rains a lot, um, you're gonna need some way to keep your soil in place. <laughs> I think um, we all know like the extreme examples would be like, you know, mudslides. Um, that doesn't happen so much on, on you know, the rolling hills in Missouri like that. But we do have, you know, when a raindrop hits, it's it's a very forceful thing. And then it disperses the soil and, and then it's no longer there. So we do a couple of things. We want to keep the ground covered um, with crop residue. One, it protects mm -hmm. that soil from that dispersion we just talked about, but also feeds the microbes. Um, two, we can use cover crops that are actually sending down roots and keeping something green growing for more parts of the year. That's very helpful. And, and honestly, I think farmers are continually work funding research um, from our, our checkoff that, that is continually looking at ways that we can improve um, and, and more options. You know, I think that the, the more um, tools in our, in our chest, the better, because um, we're, we're, we don't want to be, you know, like everybody has to farm this way. That gives us no differentiation and no yeah. advantage. But and we're a big country, you know, there's a 500,000 plus soybean farmers in this country. And it's very different to farm soybeans in Missouri than it is in North Dakota right. or um, South Carolina even. And we all have different weather events. And, and that in some cases buffers our risk as a country. Uh, but in other ways, um, we have to learn from each other and and try to utilize best practices that some of us have discovered and and you know listen and learn. That makes a lot of sense because 
as we already pointed out, like the soil is so diverse already, it's just going to be different everywhere. How do you replicate one model of farming, one way of thinking? It wouldn't be good for business. It wouldn't be good for, for anybody. It wouldn't be good for the environment. It wouldn't be good for the soil. It's really interesting to think about, uh, Megan. Now, from like a personal level and growth, um, how do you see farming now than when you started when you were, say, you know, you were your children's age? Well, I think it's more exciting. Maybe it's because I just know more now, but I think that we're looking beyond our own farms. Um, I think in, especially in these last few years, we've talked more and more in agriculture about how so our sustainability story doesn't stop at our farm gate. Um, it goes on to the next person who bought our soybeans or corn from our farm. And so in some ways that's, that's fun because I think about um, how we have a global impact from you know, our, our, our little farm here in Missouri, you know, um, one of the, my favorite experiences since I was on the soybean board was going to New York city and we were talking about the utilization of biodiesel in their, um, in their garbage trucks and their entire, you know, New York city has made a big commitment about reducing their greenhouse gas emissions and they're going with electric and utilizing biodiesel, um, in their, all their, their fleet. And um, the reason I like I thought, oh, that's great. You know, it's a, a market. And then the alderman said, I just want to thank you, because the reason that we're so passionate about this is because biodiesel reduced the emissions. And we have such an asthma problem in New York City that so many children require asthma medication and even, you know, the the um, mm -hmm. breathing uh, treatments at night. And it just took me back a little bit as a mother with young children huh. of thinking about how this, you know, I look across our fields of green and our, you know, blue skies, and I don't even think about air quality really. It's just, we're so mm -hmm. spread out. And that we're producing something on our farm that goes to New York City to improve not only um, their sustainability as far as carbon footprint, but it improves the air that they breathe um that's huge and that really i think about that a lot more every time we cross our fields of the impact we have for other on other people hmm. yeah everything seems to impact everything whether it's <laughs> with, uh, your farm right or or kind of decisions that we make as consumers i heard that you know we there's just so many different types of crops out there but we've kind of come to this like monocultural um society where we're just eating or uh, consuming just specific, like, well, like, well, I don't know, it's like 20 different types of crops. Like it's not that many different types of crops. Hmm. Is there an interest in um, farming or spreading awareness about the upsides of different crops? And is there any type of benefit to uh, the soils and, and thus climate change for that? Crop rotation is always a, a good thing. Um, and we have seen benefits in the, the soil, but I think it's also important to keep in mind that affordable food is a good thing too. Mm -hmm. And that um, we have to balance that. So on our farm, we, we're only farming two crops and we do rotate them. Uh, and that helps the, the, um, the microbes in the soil. That's a, it's a, you know, it, and uh, the nitrogen that um, my soybeans fix helps provide nitrogen for my corn. Um, and a lot of that is due to the microbial activity too. So on the other side, we also enjoy the m most affordable food in the world here in the United States. And so sometimes we can take that for granted too, but a lot of that is because we've become efficient in, um, in, in our systems and that we have, you know, I, I have to have a different head on my combine for my soybeans than I do my corn. Um, if I were raising cotton, I would have a completely different cotton picker. If I were, um, you know, different uh, pumpkins or uh, vegetables, these are all different pieces of equipment. And so if everybody were to raise everything, it would be a little bit difficult. So we have specialization. We also have different climates in the U.S. And so, um, you know, I think the point that you're making is great, but it doesn't have to be either or. We can be mindful about improving our soil. We can be mindful about preserving our soil and being um, you know, uh, environmentally friendly without making this choice of, I have to have you know, everything on my farm. 
keeping in mind, I think sometimes people think back to, well, my grandparents' farm, they had, you know, um, cattle and horses and, or, you know, this idea of old McDonald's farm. And 70% of the United States used to be directly involved in agriculture. And today it's more like 1%. Mm. And that's not a bad thing. That's just a reality. And so we, it, instead of all of us having a cow for milk, now we have cat, <laughs> dairy farms and they specialize in that and they take their nutrition incredibly seriously. They, they take their health and sanitation incredibly seriously. And then they're able to pasteurize it so that it can travel further. Um, for the rest of us who don't live on a dairy farm. And so specialization is is great. And um, I think the thing that I focus on from um, my role in dairy production or beef production is making sure that the corn and soybeans that I grow um, start with a healthy soil and resulting in a healthy crop that, that better improves um, the next farmer down the line. And continuing on that uh, conversation of the next farmer down the line, next generation, next generational thinking, what about like water usage, fresh water usage? Like I heard the agricultural industry consumes like 98% of our fresh water. Have you heard anything like that? And is there anything being done to think about innovating ways to continue production, but also reserve water supply? Yeah. So that's, I have no idea about that stat, so I, I can't speak to that in particular. What I can speak to is that on our farm, when we think about water usage um, and keeping in mind that when you put a lot of water, most of it's going back in the soil and back into the, the water table of where we just pumped it from. Okay. Um, but I will also say that we can variable rate irrigate too. So if I hit a sandy, we know some sandier soils, they can't hold on to the water as long as a clay soil. So I'm going to have to do less more often. And then I might hit a part that's heavier. Um, we call it CEC, which is cation exchange capacity. But that means it's got a heavier soil and it might hold on to things a little bit tighter. Um, I can maybe put more on or less often because it's able to hold it there longer without the subsurface drainage. Um, we've got some really fascinating research of where you might have a holding pond on your farm where it would rain. And then we have mm. um, tiles that would feed into that pond during the wet times. And then in the, in the drought of mid or late summer that we use subsurface drainage and irrigation, um, I'm sorry, use the irrigation portion to use osmosis and pull that water back up. So you're drain, draining it so you can get the crop planted on time. Um, and then you're, pulling the water back up when when it's not coming from the sky. And, and so you're more efficient that way because you don't have the evaporation. Um, so I think it would be, again, this is an area where people are being incredibly innovative and coming up with new ideas because, um, yeah, we don't want to be wasteful. We know that water is a finite um, uh resource and um it's incredibly important to us it's expensive too by the way yeah. <laughs> you know you don't buy something uh if you don't if you don't want to or if you if you don't um need to and um it costs you know energy to move water and put it on so um but at the same time you can't just put something out there and not protect it um so this is in a lot of case our risk mitigation by having irrigation and um I think that we will continue to see the ability that we can map our water usage. We can map the water needs of our crop and make sure that we're not um, falling below those lines. I mean, there's apps for that too. <laughs> and um, we monitor them very closely. There's moisture sensors that we use in the soil. Um, we get reports every time it rains on each field. How much if we got two tenths on this field and we got four tenths of an inch on another field? Um, water is the number one uh, concern that we don't have full control over, but um, being able to monitor it closely is is key. So I don't think you'll find anyone trying to use water when they don't need to. Right. Um, I think you'll find actually the opposite of farmers saying, oh, you know, can we hold off another day? You think it's going to sprinkle this afternoon? Um, and uh, we'll continue to work on utilizing technology to better improve our efficiencies. And that's what it comes down to. It seems like just 
who can create the most efficient farm with this precision agricultural and yeah. you use the term in there, you know, risk mitigation. So I'm just like curious, like from like a business perspective, what are some of the things you're looking at in terms of investment when you're looking down the road and you said you're trying to forecast out what could happen, what risk could come in the way? Is it water usage? Is it land usage? Is it pollution? Is it distribution costs? What are this, some of the things that kind of factor into your decision making from an investment perspective? So um, risk mitigation is a big part of it on the farm. Um, you know, we look at different seed traits that are more resist, resilient in um, wetter or drier years. Uh, uh, drought resistance genetics are a big business of um, trying to make sure that the seed itself can actually be more efficient with water. Um, and then I guess maybe from my hopeful standpoint, um, business-wise, what I look at are what are the disruptors? What are the things that right now, uh, what do we need to be working on that I can use my soybean oil for something that replaces um, a fossil fuel? You know, what are the, the ways that um, I can, you know, make a plastic bottle more biodegradable by utilizing soybean oil hmm. that I've raised in a uh, sustainable manner and in a, you know, an efficient manner that um, with, you know, I've sequestered carbon, I've minimized my greenhouse gas emissions, and now I've got this soybean oil. And by the way, I can produce soybean oil um, as a side product really with um, the meal that goes to feed animals or humans. Um, and so it's a twofer. So now I've got this oil that I can use in, in industrial applications like um, replacing oil in tires. Mm. Um, Goodyear has been launching soybean oil based tire lines so that, yeah, isn't it great? I mean, um, if I can have, you know, a plastic water bottle um, that doesn't end up in the ocean because it biodegrades because it's made of soybean oil. These are not things that are or straws. That's another huge one. These are not things that were all the way there yet, but it's been a big investment by farmers to try to find uses mm -hmm. for an oil that we're already producing. Um, and how can we benefit other areas of, um, of other sectors really and in, of industry? Just more ways to be efficient, I guess. Are there any, yeah. Like, so that we're all, you know, we want to be mindful, but sometimes we mindlessly have to do things. We're on the go, you know, or um, we, if it's just ingrained in our daily operations, um, you know, if, if we had 100% biodiesel, it would be a 74% reduction in greenhouse gases. And even at like just a 10% blend, which is what we use in every one of our combines, trucks, and and um, tractors on our farm, that's a 7.4% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions just by choosing biodiesel. Wow. It seems like farmers have a stronger presence and role in, you know, kind of reversing this and turning this around than I previously thought. I mean, do you feel like a sense of responsibility in this whole grand scheme of things? Absolutely. I think, you know, sometimes um, you hear, oh, we feed the world and people are like, well, do you though? Because <laughs> it's so grandiose, but it is something that we talk about um, on a on a on a daily basis. You know, when we're sitting at dinner, um, we're talking with our son about, oh, this beef came from our friends down the road. Um, this this pork at one point ate soybeans from our farm. Um, and, and then this idea of how we can use, um, this application and in industrial uses, um, to not only feed and fuel, but to improve, you know, everybody's sustainability footprint mm -hmm. and also maybe even improve, um, air quality for people to breathe. It's, um, yeah, you, you feel a sense of responsibility and also a sense of pride that we're having a real impact. It's just crazy to think about, you know, like the microorganism in the soil is in the, you know, the, the yields that are your farm harvest that then is sold and then put into something else that I am now digesting and putting back into the world. It's just the, this continuous cycle. And when we think about health, overall health of your farm, which can impact the overall health of consumer diets, 
do you see consumer behaviors towards more transparency in crops and what they're eating impacting the agricultural industry to use, let's say, less pesticides, less um, synthetic products that could be influencing their intake? Well, I think the thing that we've learned um, over this past year is that supply chain and and being able to rely on food being on the shelves, uh, being able to rely on feeding our families, that that is the first. Um, I think it was Norman Borlaug who said, yeah. um, you know, a country that eats has many problems, but a country that doesn't has only one. And so I, we have to always keep in mind that we get these choices um, and we should educate ourselves. And, um, you know, people being educated and saying, I want to make sure that what I eat comes from a sustainable farm. Um, that's that's good. That drives us all to be better. That's good. We want to make sure that there's transparency so that you're, you're being honest and open with the consumers too, that real labeling, you know, there's no reason to have um, that something doesn't, in, isn't included on an, in, you know, when it's not included in, on anybody's ingredients. Um, we see that happen. And I think that's very frustrating for people in agriculture sometimes is that we're like, we'll be at the grocery store and it, it, it'll say something like non-GMO. And it's like, well, nobody has GMO, whatever that product is. And so um, yeah. that, that disingenuous um, labeling, sure. I think kind of irks us in agriculture sometimes, and that doesn't help us be any better. It kind of, you know, that's not nice. But I, I think that it's important as farmers at the end of the day, um, we want to know what the market wants from us. We want, there's no reason to grow something nobody wants. And so we're continually making, you know, looking and seeing what, what, what the market says and uh, responding to it. Uh, well, the market, Kevin's market saying that Kevin wants to see how much manganese specifically is in the Kaiser farm. Yeah. I, yeah, I can pull up this little report and share the screen with you if you'd like, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, manganese is very important. Um, and yeah, again, it all goes back to your seventh grade biology class talking about the Krebs cycle, making sure those nutrients are in the soil so that we can uh, make sure it's in the crop, make sure it's in the animal, and that we have a healthy human at the end of the day. Do you think the next big innovations in agricultural are gonna be more organic, uh, or are they gonna be more technologically driven? Well, I don't think it's um, a choice. Um, I think as far as maybe your definition of organic, I'm not sure, but as far as- Natural. Well, like, yeah, I think that, um, that, that comes down to what we define. I guess when I say something's going to organically happen, it means like if just kind of crowd rising is how it's going to happen. If you mean like everybody's going to grow by the definition of organic, um, probably not. You know, I, I think that just like any other business that we will continue to match up with what the market wants. And I think right now what the market is telling us is grow us a, a, a nutritious, um, a healthy crop that we can rely on, that we can build our ingredient list based on and do that in a way that you are not harming the earth. And mm -hmm. I think that is something we are very focused on delivering. Do you factor that into, it seems like you do, but do you factor that into your decision making when you're going to make those investments? And have you ever faced a, a difficult decision? <laughs> well, yes, we've all faced difficult decisions. Um, I guess, um, I, I don't know if I, I see it as, it's more about the opportunities that are out there. Um, I think in any business, differentiation is what makes you stronger and what why people come to you as a brand. And I think one of the ways that in soy we are building our brand is talking about sustainability. And in some cases, I think that um, in agriculture, maybe at first we were afraid that like people were attacking us or saying we weren't sustainable. And actually, I think now people are looking for solutions and we're like, wait a minute, we can do that. We can do that, right. too. Um, we can we can be in your paint products. We can be in your your um, you know your garden wrap. We can um, be a a better ingredient for you um, because we work so hard on our sustainability story that we can be part of yours. Hmm. 
Megan, you seem really, really passionate about, you know, agriculture. Obviously it's been ingrained into you ever since, uh, you know, you're a little kid. Um, do you feel like a, a deeper sense of purpose uh, around what you do? Like, do you do things beyond just your bottom line? Do you feel like? Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's, um, you know, just, you can't put a price tag on making sure that I have clean water on my farm for my kids to drink, that I have clean air for my kids to breathe, um, and that they could potentially, if they choose to, um, take a, over the farm someday and make it even better than what, you know, their father and I had in our wildest dreams. I think that we have also kind of this um, historical perspective too of, we've had all of these generations come before us that each made their contribution so that we enjoy a very um, nutrient rich farm today. And what can we do to make that better? And I think technology has been a lot of that answer. Um, I think that, you know, as we look at new technologies coming around, even um, medicine, that when we talk about CRISPR and, and some of these other aspects, that these are things that are improving our sustainability. Um, they are improving um, the vitality of the crop we grow and improving um, human life. And it's it's exciting, and we have to do a lot of ground truthing. But um, I think it's uh, things will continue to change. That in the past ten years, how far we've come, uh, even to today, that it's it's moving fast. It's been a very consistent theme and message, kind of throughout this interview today. This long term thinking, this uh, historical perspective, um, doing things for the greater whole, for the greater health. I think that takes a lot of wisdom a lot of leadership. So Megan, let's drive this home. What is your definition of a real leader? My definition of a real leader is somebody who is willing to listen. I think um, one of the things I heard early on in my career is whose idea does it have to be a, to be a good one? And that comes to me a lot because sometimes when we talk to someone who we think may be opposed to the way I farm or may have ideas and um, I can still learn something from them and maybe I'll make some benefits to my farm because of, of their thought and perspective. And it's also important to be open to the idea of mm. maybe sometimes we, we um, don't know as much about something as we thought we did. And so I think it's incredibly important, especially today, to be somebody who listens to other people that you either were predisposed to think that you might disagree with them um, or that you already thought you did agree with them. Listen, and um, I think we're we're in a space right now that we could all really benefit from listening to each other and trying to to give a little more grace uh, to other ideas. Powerful message uh, from Megan Kaiser. I'm Kevin Edwards asking you to go out there, be willing to listen, and always, folks, keep it real. Thanks, Megan. Thank you, Kevin.